Hello and welcome to today's lecture. The lesson objective for this session is to analyze and study the Sri Lankan English poems, Life and Death of a Hawk and the Scholar by Patrick Fernando. So in both these poems, we see Fernando's use of Western trajectories in his writing, indications of his classical education, as well as Catholicism, pathetic fallacy and philosophical tendencies. So let's first go to the poem, Life and Death of a Hawk. Uh, first of all, I would like to start with a reading of this poem, Life and Death of a Hawk by Patrick Fernando. Here, where are no rock blots out the sun. Albatross never comes, no eagle soars. He ruled the high blue kingdom. Bird matins he disdained, was already gone long before sunset puzzled us over his horn. Ball, rushes, sickly for mountain. Did he sleep at all while the owl explored the dark for stranded mice with the hunter round the pole? The height he maintained with secret entrance and exit kept his color, size and form, vague as with its kings. Add to this perfect silence, singularity, and that ceaseless, solitary wheeling round the sun. You might have said he belonged to the firmament, the second act of creation, launched after, after the sun was lit, before the earth was bold and spun. Logic snaps. This monarch of the air descending on a kitchen yard for a chicken was shot and blundered like a drunkard up a stair three days and in a little corpse nearby hung a gray thing in a veil of flies dripping vent eyes shut neck stretched every okay so now let's go back to the beginning um first of all i would like to say i would like to remind you about the fisherman mod by his wife which is a poem we have studied earlier so in The Fisherman Mourned by His Wife by Patrick Fernando, he engages with two opposing states, right? Two opposing contrasting states. So in that poem, he refers in the beginning to the birth of a new life. And then towards the end, he refers to a sense of finality by referring to the fisherman's death. So we see this use of two opposing elements or two binary states called life and death, right? And it is precisely life and death that we see in this particular poem too. So therefore you can find similarities in both these poems in terms of, uh, in terms of how both poems refer to the opposing binary or contrasting states, right? So in this case, we see him referring to the life of this great and dignified creature, the whole. And his, dis and his disgraceful death, right? So we see that the poem deliberates on how the hawk's heroic and dignified state and majestic appearance is reduced and devalued to that of a completely and utterly defeated, demeaning and undignified one. And also we see that the hawk is addressed as a he and not an it. Right? It's always he and not an it, which is very interesting because we can say that here P Fernando has incorporated the poetic technique of personification. And you know that personification means the attribution of human characteristics to inanimate objects, to animals, and forces or phenomena of nature, right? So here, when he says, here there are no rock blots out the sun. He specifically suggests a place where you do not find the presence of the rock, the albatross and the eagle, right? So first of all, let's look at what a rock is. Uh, in this slide, in this uh, screen, I'm showing you a picture of a rock and a rock, as you can see, is an enormous legendary bird of, uh, bird of prey. But this is obviously not a real creature, right? This is not a real creature, but instead it is from a popular mythology in the Middle East, right? 
And the rock is also described in Arabian fairy tales and sailor's folklore as well. So it's not a real creature, it is a mythological creature. Um, so he says that this is a place where the rock, the albatross or no eagle soars, right? Uh, so if you take the albatross, that is another bird of prey, but it is not a mythological one. It is actually a realistic one. It is a large white bird with strong, uh, long wings and who lives near the sea, especially in the areas of the Pacific and the South Atlantic Oceans. And here he says that the rock, albatross and eagle, they are not here, right? So for us to understand what is the importance of this, we have to understand the implications of the of these three birds and what they what they signify, right? So the the rock, albatross, and the eagle are all seabirds in the coastal area, and they are all known for their majestic and dignified appearance. So it is important that Fernando distinguishes the hawk from all these birds to establish that it is indeed the hawk who ruled the high blue kingdom, and that is to signify the sea. So the critic DCRA Gunapilaka says that by doing so, by establishing the unique position of that of the hawk, Fernando places hawk as this unchallenged monarch who is powerful and preeminent, impressive, a figure invested in, grandeur, right? So he says that he ruled, of course, you see the reference to he here, so that is the indication of personification. He ruled, he's the monarch of the high blue kingdom. And then he says, bird matins, he disdained, was already gone long before sunset, puzzled us over his home. So he, the hawk, disliked bird songs and was already gone, and was gone long before the sunset and that is the end of the day. And this would puzzle us, the readers, according to Patrick Fernando, as to where exactly his home is, whether it's in the bowl, rushes, sea cliff, or mountain. As we are unaware about where he lives, whether it's a bowl or rushes, sea cliff, or mountain, right? Um, so through the fact that we are unaware of the living habitat of this bird, Fernando associates an element of mystery to it, right? And a surrealistic element to it, which is very interesting. And then he continues on to say, did he sleep at all while the owl explored the dark for stranded mice with the hunter round the pole, the height he maintained with secret entrance. So again, with the words like secret, we see how uh, Patrick Fernando intentionally associates a sense of mystery and surrealism with his deliberations regarding the hawk, right? And then he continues on to say, and exist and exit, kept his color, size and form vague as with its king. So vague, as you know, means uncertain, right? As befit kings, again associates with monarchy or rulership, creating a very powerful uh, set of visual images which attributes to regal qualities and majestic as well as grandiose elements to Fernando's deliberations of the hawk, right? So therefore we can say that Fernando gives a very strong presence, a very majestic presence to the hawk. Right, and this poem is one of the best examples in among Fernando's poetry, where we see how bird imagery is certainly at the forefront in uh, his poems. Right, and this is also by using bird images like that, we can see that this is a this is also an example of pathetic fallacy that we see incorporated in Fernando's work. Right, and then he continues on to say. Add to these perfect silence, singularity, and that ceaseless solitary being belonged around the sun. You might have, you might as well, you might have said he belonged to the firmament, the second act of creation, launched after the sun was lit. So he says that he uh, belonged to the firmament. So that means the heavens or the sky. 
and the second of act of creation refers to the second act of bringing the world up into an ordered existence launched after the sun was lit uh, so it is almost as if uh, Fernando is saying that the hope belonged to the second act of existence after the world was created, the sun's existence. All these, the idea that he's trying to put forward here is that all these natural phenomena came into being, giving such a significance to the existence and presence of the hawk, right? And then he continues on to say, before the earth was pulled and spun. Then um, after like uh, going through his deliberations of the majestic and uh, grandiose appearance and presence of the hawk, and now we finally approach to how he's approaching to his dignified, uh, to his uh, devalued state, right? It starts with saying, logic snaps. So there is a sense of urgency and a sense of immediacy in this statement, right? When he says logic snaps, a sudden, uh, a sudden action, right? And then he says, this monarch of the air, suddenly there is a fall from grace. It is like a fall from a high and elevated, uh, elevated position to the ground, right? Descending on a kitchen yard for a chicken, so this mighty hawk who once commanded the air has now descended to the kitchen yard for a chicken because he was shot, right? Shot uh, as a result of human intervention. So to a certain extent, uh, you see the devastating consequences or repercussions of uh, human intervention of, on nature, right? Uh, on nature and animals here in terms of how the bird was shot as a result of human intervention. He says, was shot and blundered like a drunkard astir. So with here, with, uh, uh, with this uh, statement, like a drunkard upstairs, you see that uh, Fernando has incorporated another poetic technique and that is a simile, right? So blundered means moving clumsily. So a drunkard would not be in command of his motion and his five senses, right? He would, he or she would clumsily move up uh, the stairs. So when this folk who once flew in such a graceful, dignified and majestic manner before was shot and then he falls down from grace, falls down from that elevated position according to uh, the interpretation by uh, Patrick Fernando, right? And then he continues on to say, three days and a little corpse nearby hung a great thing in a veil of flies. So now that once majestic and grandiose hawk is now a gray thing, right? So now you see that it is objectified. It is devalued, reduced to a grotesque and abject corpse, a dead body right, which is feasted by the flies, dripping vent, eyes shut, neck stretched every. So it's dripping liquid, maybe from the body, perhaps blood, eyes shut, neck stretched in an awkward angle, right. So therefore, in this poem, we see uh, Fernando's exploration of these two oppositions, right, and that is, of course, life and death, as we have mentioned before. So apart from that, we can also see an opposition in terms of the address with relation to these two states as well, right? Because this is because when the hope was living, when he was within this uh, state or existence of life, he is addressed as he, as the poet has incorporated here, the technique of personification. But when the hope is shot dead, the hawk is addressed as a thing, right? As an object to further emphasize the state of devaluation and uh, the height in which the hawk has fallen from grace. And apart from that, we can also say that another thematic preoccupation in this poem is perhaps uh, the philosophical notion, the inevitability of death. So here we see uh, Fernando engaging with his philosophical tendencies 
by referring to uh, the inevitability of death, which we can also interpret as a philosophical concern, right? So as you know, uh, this particular theme is usually a theme that is recurrently used by romantic poets, romantic British poets, right? So maybe we can say that this is indicative of Fernando's Western inheritance as a Sri Lankan English writer, right? How he's influenced by Western trajectories in writing, by the British trajectories and classical, uh, and uh, a result of his classical education, right? And therefore, uh, if you try to explore in this uh, philosophical term, the inevitability of death, uh, we can say that despite the regal and dignified presence of the hawk, uh, despite the existence of the hawk as this monarch of the air, as the ruler of the air, uh, his full of majesticity and uh, grand, uh, grandeur. Despite all of that, we can say that his fall from grace is inevitable. And why is it inevitable? Because despite his majesticity, the hawk is still a living being, right? And as such, the fate of all living beings is to inevitably meet death, as life is something very transitory. Transitory means not permanent. So therefore, even if we say that the hawk can be symbolical of authority figures, authority figures, we can say that Fernando depicts the fleeting and momentary nature of power and supremacy wielded by such authority figures. Why? Because the authority and power wielded by uh, such figures never last forever, right? Because they are living beings and all living beings are subjected to the inevitable state of death, right? So even that way too, like we can uh, interpret this poem. So what eventually happens to uh, those authority figures with uh, those authority figures, those monarch-like figures who have so much power uh, and majesticity, right? How even they can be reduced to something devalued, uh, reduced to an object like this, a mere thing, just like the hope, right? Okay. So now from there, I'm going to another poem by Patrick Fernando, and that is The Scholar. Okay, so that is, uh, The Scholar is a short poem, as you can see. Uh, I will first start with a reading of The Scholar, and then we will go to, uh, to the analysis of this poem. The scholar by Patrick Fernando, pale from long entombment in many ancient libraries, into the light he crawled at last draped heavy in degrees. He could not let the sun sink down, but had to quote a line, splash and scud of waves at night was Ariadne sighing. Song of birds in the morning never reached his ear alone without cerebral echoes of some work he had done. And senses lost their purity, being always rudely met by his lusting for endorsement from thinker, saint, or poet. But at the close, his mind went blank, not sorrowful, not gay, and death was far too primitive for erudite display when from the mind's imprisonment his body broke away it burst into song of praise from silent humble clay nurturing with tenderness the buds to break in blossom the praises that his mind denied sung at last for ransom so this uh, this the scholar is a poem which clearly brings out uh, patrick fernando's classical inheritance of that of a scholar, right? So in this poem, we see a very jaded, dark, and uh, even nihilistic idea on education, right? So nihilistic with reference to education uh, would mean to depict education as something meaningless, as something hollow that is empty and worthless and a worthless institution. Uh, 
as well as enterprise or establishment, right? So Fernando expresses by this a very philosophical notion of uh, education by showing how it has dulled the senses, sensations, and the natural human responses to individuals, right? It's a, it begins by saying, pale from long entombment in many ancient libraries. So here, entombment refers to the act or ceremony of putting a dead body in its final resting place, according to the dictionary meaning. So here we can say that he infers the word entombment with education to associate a very ominous, foreboding, dark and deathly image with it. So uh, the visual images which can be connotated by the word entombment are filled with uh, ominous, right? Are filled with a sense of uh, ominousness and uh, deathly as well as uh, something very foreboding, right? Something bad is going to happen, right? So you see that Fernando describes the experience of long entombment in ancient libraries. And we can say that though it is evident that the library, which is generally considered as the place where, which is enriched with the, with the wealth uh, of education and knowledge here is considered to be something very unconventional, right? because it is considered to be a period spent in long entombment instead. It is not considered as a place or a space where you can access uh, to the richness or wealth of education and knowledge. Instead, it is a period spent in long entombment. And then he says, into the light he crawled at last, draped heavy in degrees. So that is very interesting as well. Right, so the degree certificates are presented not as accomplishments and achievements like you conventionally see. Instead, they are seen as burdens, right? And as an added weight on the individual because he says that the individual has to literally crawl into the light with, heavy, with the heavy weight of his degrees, which indicates to what extent the degrees can be a burden, right? And then he says, he could not let the sun sink down, but had to quote a line, splash and scud, scudding is like beating, the way of waves at night was Ariadne sighing. So Ariadne is a Cretan princess in Greek mythology. Uh, so therefore, with this reference, uh, we can say we can say that that is an example of uh, the reference to Greek mythology. Can be, uh, sorry, uh, the reference to Greek mythology can be indicative of Fernando's Western inheritance as well as classical education which he actually received in London. Right. So with these kind of indications, we see uh, references or indications of this uh, Western classical inheritance and education. And then he continues on to say, song of birds in the morning never reached his ear alone. So we can say that, uh, we can see that he cannot even appreciate the sounds of nature, bird songs, as what echoed in his ear are those of the echoes of intellect of the past works that he has done, right? So again, apart from the use of pathetic fallacy, uh, which you can see here, what we can say is that Fernando indicates how this scholar has completely lost all ability to appreciate anything using his senses, right? So instead, uh, he has become a very mechanical person um, without cerebral echoes of some work he had done. Uh, so cerebral echoes can be the reference to echoes of intellect, perhaps, and senses lost their purity being always rudely met by his lusting for endorsement, right? Um, so endorsement from thinker, saint or poet. So it is evident that he also, the scholar also desires to be acknowledged by uh, his fellow intellectuals, such as thinkers, saints and poets, despite losing 
all this uh, purity of his senses and becoming a very mechanical person. And then uh, Fernando continues on to say, but at the close his mind went blank, not sorrowful, no gay, not gay, but when. Uh, so therefore, when he did, did the line, but at the close, his, this mind went blank and sorrowful, not gay. Uh, we can understand that when death comes, his mind, the scholar's mind went blank, right? It was not too sorrowful and it was not too happy. And, uh, and therefore, we can say that uh, with the line, death was far too primitive for erudite display. It's an indication of, uh, of death being considered to be lacking in sophistication uh, in terms of an elite display of great knowledge of learning, right? And then he says, when from the mind's imprisonment, the body broke, his body broke away. So, however, it shows that when the body finally breaks free from the mind's confinements and restrictions at the state of death, in the end, the scholar's soul actually has been longing for or looking at something unadulterated, that means something pure and primitive in nature. Right. So it has not been this elite and erudite display of knowledge and intellect that his mind wishes for. Right. Instead, his soul, his soul wishes for something purely unadulterated, something very primitive in nature, something which he can sensually appreciate by his five senses. So that is what the soul has been longing for. And then it says at the state of death. It bursts into a song of praise from silent humble clay, nurturing with tenderness the buds to break in blossom. The praises that his mind denied sung at last for ransom, right? So that is why it says in the poem, it bursts into a song of praise, nurturing with tenderness the buds break in blossom. The praises that mind denied sung at last in freedom, right? Uh, at last for random. So it is only through the state of death that he's able to reach what, he's, what he truly uh, longed for, right? Something very pure, something very unadulterated, primitive in nature, which can be appreciated with sensuality, something which can be appreciated with the five senses instead of this uh, mechanical person he has become as a result of uh, the long entombment of ancient libraries and education, which is evidently interpreted not in a conventional way, but uh, as a period of long entombment, something very ominous or something very foreboding. So overall, uh, in summary, we can say that this poem is about how the senses, pleasures and sensations of everyday life are dulled down with too much influence and seriousness in education. It is about how this individual, how this scholar has lost because of his heavy investment towards education. And by the end, when he finally realizes what he truly longs for, what his soul truly longs for, it is already too late as he only realizes it when he reached the final point of his life, and that is in the state of death. So even in this poem, we can see that uh, Fernando engages with these two opposing states, and that is life and death, right? And that is something common, which we can see in both the poems. Okay, so this is the place I'm going to conclude my lecture on Patrick Fernando. Thank you very much for listening.